suchness give rise to the good causes and effects in this and in the other world alike. The significance of the term yana in the compound, Mahayana, the term yana is introduced because all enlightened ones have ridden on this vehicle, and all enlightened ones to be, being led by this principle, will reach the stage of Tathagata. Part 3. Interpretation. The part on outline has been given, next the part on interpretation of the principle of Mahayana will be given. It consists of three chapters, revelation of the true meaning, correction of evil attachments, analysis of the types of aspiration for enlightenment. Chapter 1. Revelation of true meaning. I, one mind and its two aspects. The revelation of the true meaning of the principle of Mahayana can be achieved by unfolding the doctrine that the principle of one mind has two aspects. One is the aspect of mind in terms of the absolute, and the other is the aspect of mind in terms of phenomena. Each of these two aspects embraces all states of existence. Why? Because these two aspects are mutually inclusive. A. Mind in terms of the absolute. The mind in terms of the absolute is the one world of reality and the essence of all phases of existence in their totality. That which is called the essential nature of the mind is unborn and is imperishable. It is only through illusions that all things come to be differentiated. If one is freed from illusions, then to him there will be no appearances of objects regarded as absolutely independent existences, therefore all things from the beginning transcend all forms of verbalization, description, and conceptualization and are, in the final analysis, undifferentiated, free from alteration, and indestructible. They are only of the one mind, hence the name suchness. All explanations by words are provisional and without validity, for they are merely used in accordance with illusions and are incapable of denoting suchness. The term suchness likewise has no attributes which can be verbally specified. The term suchness is, so to speak, the limit of verbalization wherein a word is used to put an end to words. But the essence of suchness itself cannot be put an end to, for all things in their absolute aspect are real, nor is there anything which needs to be pointed out as real, for all things are equally in the state of suchness. It should be understood that all things are incapable of being verbally explained or thought of, hence the name suchness. Question, if such is the meaning of the principle of Mahayana, how is it possible for men to conform themselves to and enter into it? Answer, if they understand that, concerning all things, though they are spoken of, there is neither that which speaks, nor that which can be spoken of, and though they are thought of, there is neither that which thinks, nor that which can be thought of, then they are said to have conformed to it. And when they are freed from their thoughts, they are said to have entered into it. Next, suchness has two aspects if predicated in words. One is that it is truly empty, for this aspect can, in the final sense, reveal what is real. The other is that it is truly non-empty, for its essence itself is endowed with undefiled and excellent qualities. One, truly empty. Suchness is empty because from the beginning it has never been related to any defiled states of existence, it is free from all marks of individual distinction of things, and it has nothing to do with thoughts conceived by a deluded mind. It should be understood that the essential nature of suchness is neither with marks nor without marks, neither not with marks nor not without marks, nor is it both with and without marks simultaneously, it is neither with a single mark nor with different marks, neither not with a single mark or not with different marks, nor is it both with a single and with different marks simultaneously. In short, since all unenlightened men discriminate with their deluded minds from moment to moment, they are alienated from suchness, hence, the definition, empty, but once they are free from their deluded minds, they will find that there is nothing to be negated. 2. Truly non-empty. Since it has been made clear that the essence of all things is empty, i.e., devoid of illusions, the true mind is eternal, permanent, immutable, pure, and self-sufficient, therefore, it is called non-empty. And also there is no trace of particular marks to be noted in it, as it is the sphere that transcends thoughts and is in harmony with enlightenment alone. b. The mind in terms of phenomena. 1. The storehouse consciousness. The mind as phenomena is grounded on the Tathagatagarbha. What is called the storehouse consciousness is that in which neither birth nor death diffuses harmoniously with birth and death, 
and yet in which both are neither identical nor different. This consciousness has two aspects which embrace all states of existence and create all states of existence. They are, the aspect of enlightenment, and the aspect of non-enlightenment. A. The aspect of enlightenment. Original enlightenment. The essence of mind is free from thoughts. The characteristic of that which is free from thoughts is analogous to that of the sphere of empty space that pervades everywhere. The one without any second, i.e. the absolute aspect of the world of reality is none other than the undifferentiated dharmakaya, the essence body, of the Tathagata. Since the essence of mind is grounded on the dharmakaya, it is to be called the original enlightenment. Why? Because, original enlightenment indicates the essence of mind in contradistinction to the essence of mind in the process of actualization of enlightenment, the process of actualization of enlightenment is none other than the process of integrating the identity with the original enlightenment. The process of actualization of enlightenment. Grounded on the original enlightenment is non-enlightenment. And because of non-enlightenment, the process of actualization of enlightenment can be spoken of. Now, to be fully enlightened to the fountainhead of mind is called the final enlightenment, and not to be enlightened to the fountainhead of mind, non-final enlightenment. What is the meaning of this? An ordinary man becomes aware that his former thoughts were wrong, then he is able to stop such thoughts from arising again. Although this sometimes may also be called enlightenment, properly it is not enlightenment at all because it is not enlightenment that reaches the fountainhead of mind. The followers of Hinayana, who have some insight, and those bodhisattvas who have just been initiated become aware of the changing state of thoughts and are free from thoughts, which are subject to change, such as the existence of a permanent self, etc. Since they have forsaken the rudimentary attachments derived from unwarranted speculation, their experience is called enlightenment in appearance. Bodhisattvas who have come to the realization of Dharmakaya become aware of the temporarily abiding state of thoughts and are not arrested by them. Since they are free from their rudimentary false thoughts derived from the speculation that the components of the world are real, their experience is called approximate enlightenment. Those bodhisattvas who have completed the stages of a bodhisattva and who have fulfilled the expedient means needed to bring forth the original enlightenment to the fullest extent will experience the oneness with suchness in an instant, they will become aware of how the inceptions of the deluded thoughts of the mind arise, and will be free from the rise of any deluded thought. Since they are far away even from subtle deluded thoughts, they are able to have an insight into the original nature of mind. The realization that mind is eternal is called the final enlightenment. It is, therefore, said in a sutra that if there is a man who is able to perceive that which is beyond thoughts he is advancing toward the Buddha wisdom. Though it is said that there is an inception of the rising of deluded thoughts in the mind, there is no inception as such that can be known as being independent of the essence of mind. And yet to say that the inception of the rising of deluded thoughts is known means that it is known as existing on the ground of that which is beyond thoughts, i.e., the essence of mind. Accordingly, all ordinary people are said not to be enlightened because they have had a continuous stream of deluded thoughts and have never been freed from their thoughts, therefore, they are said to be in a beginningless ignorance. If a man gains insight into that which is free from thoughts, then he knows how those thoughts which characterize the mind, i.e., deluded thoughts, arise, abide, change, and cease to be, for he is identical with that which is free from thoughts. But, in reality, no.